This clock says quarter of one. Yes, it really? Uh, no, that's wrong. That is wrong. Because I got two minutes to well, I got two o'clock. We should change this. Well, that clock must be dead because it was correct before. Oh, that's moving. Second hand's going around, but this looks like it. Well, that's certainly a problem. Oh, you've gone past. Oh, just two o'clock. Oh, oh, two is your right. Oh, I see what you mean. Yes, yeah, I could have made it. Yes, it's going to be off. Do you, do, you, do you know if it's bad? Well, it's clicking. Huh? Yeah. So this guy has a good method of spinning up. Can we uh, turn this light on? Aloha. All right, that was pretty good. That'll do. Aloha and welcome to today's symposium, Stellar Connections, Explorations in Cultural Astronomy. <clears throat> I'm Doug Herman, senior geographer here at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian and very happy to welcome you here today. I myself come to this topic through my work with Polynesian and Micronesian voyagers who use the stars to guide canoes thousands of miles across open ocean and find tiny dots of land. And I'm very excited to be <clears throat> part of this symposium today. Before we begin, the usual housekeeping stuff applies. If you have a cell phone, now is the time to turn it off. <clears throat> uh, so please do so, so that it does not disturb our program. After our last presentation today, our speakers will return to the stage and we will have a question and answer session. So please hold all of your questions until that time. You will see that there is a microphone set up in the middle of the ground floor here. And we would ask that you speak into the microphone when you ask a question because we have a huge, I'm sure, studio audience out there in computer land that is watching this on webcast. And if you don't use the microphone, they will not hear your questions. <clears throat> the Stellar Connection Symposium today is taking place in conjunction with a much larger Smithsonian initiative, African Cosmos Stellar Art. The centerpiece of this initiative is a very impressive major exhibition currently on view at the National Museum of African Art, which is just down the road near the Smithsonian Castle. And I encourage all of you to pay a visit, if not today, then another time. The overall project has involved astronomers, art historians, cultural specialists, and others from around the Smithsonian and beyond, including the National Air and Space Museum and Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, the National Museum of Natural History, the Anacostia Community Museum, the National Postal Museum, <clears throat> the National Zoological Park, and of course, the National Museum of the American Indian. It's a common feature of all cultures that we look up at the night sky and try to make sense of what you see. And of course, this is an important part of our work here at the NMAI. If you have not noticed already, look up and you will see that we have incorporated the night sky into our Rasmussen theater here. <clears throat> the knowledge that results from observing the night sky has served us for timekeeping, navigation, agricultural and ritual cycles, explanations <clears throat> for natural, social, and cultural phenomena, and not least importantly, as a map by which we understand our place in the cosmos. None of these, in my opinion, is less significant in our human experience than any of the others. Now today, if you're a modern person like myself, you live in a box, you hop into a box on wheels and go to some place where you work in another box, and probably you spend much of that time staring at a box like this one right here, or this one right here, and then driving back to your box, hopefully not looking at this box at the same time, and go back into your box and never really look at the night sky at all. <clears throat> As in, on the individual level in modern society, we don't really need it anymore to guide us 
and we rarely look at it or have any context really for what we are seeing. But I suggest that nothing gets your, gets your head outside the box like the enormity of the cosmos. And what we see when we look up is informed by and dependent on cultural understandings. Our four speakers today share with us different cultural understandings from different parts of the world, <clears throat> wherein the stars may look very different, serve different roles for human society, or serve the same roles but in different ways. It is my hope that through this cross-cultural encounter we may reignite ourselves in the role that the cosmos may play in our self-understandings and in our understandings of the world. We are honored to have each of our distinguished speakers here today, and my very warm thanks to all four of them for coming here to share their knowledge with us. Our first presenter today is Dr. Gary Erton. Gary is the Dumbarton Oaks Professor of Pre-Columbian Studies in the Archaeology Program of the Department of Anthropology, Harvard University. He received his PhD in Anthropology at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana in 1979. <coughs> His research focuses on a variety of topics in pre-Hispanic and early colonial intellectual history in the Andes, drawing on materials and methods in archaeology, ethnohistory, and ethnography. He's the author of numerous articles and books on Andean Quechua cultures and Inca civilizations, including At the Crossroads of the Earth and Sky, History of a Myth, The Social Life of Numbers, Inca Myths, Signs of the Inca Quipu, and the Quipu, Kipus of the Laguna de los Condores. He is the founder director of the Kipu Database Project at Harvard University since 2002 and a collaborator on NMAI's upcoming Inca Road exhibition. Dr. Erton's presentation is entitled <clears throat> Cosmologies of the Milky Way, South American Views on the Unity of Earth and Sky. Please, a very warm welcome to Dr. Gary Erton. Thanks very much to uh, Doug for that welcome, and thanks to Doug and to Elizabeth for their uh, help in, uh, in um, uh, uh, calling this symposium and getting it together. And I uh, uh, feel extremely pleased and honored to be a participant in the program. I also just want to say that I'm very pleased that uh, the native peoples of South America and their cosmological traditions are considered to be a part of the subject matter of American Indian cosmologies. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today is a set of cosmological traditions that in the end, as you will see, focus to, to a large extent on the Milky Way. We'll talk about the Milky Way and we'll talk about how people in the Southern Hemisphere see the Milky Way and uh, what they actually do with it in terms of constructing a cosmological tradition. What we'll talk about today are uh, traditions in two major areas. Uh, there, uh, uh, we'll talk primarily about the Desana and the Barasana, who are people who live here in Colombia, in the southeastern part of Colombia. We'll then turn and talk about Quechua, or ancient uh, pre-Columbian Inca astronomy. And I put another name on the map there, the Bororo, who live in, in um, uh, uh, north-central Brazil, and about whose cosmology we know a fair amount, but unfortunately we don't have very good visual materials on that, so I won't be talking about that today. Today we'll focus on the Desana and the Barasana, uh, and on the Quechua uh, uh, tradition that descended from the Incaic tradition. The thing, as I've mentioned, that will, that will stand out so strikingly when we look at these cosmological traditions is the importance of the Milky Way. We, of course, see the Milky Way here in the Northern Hemisphere, but I want to demonstrate to you uh, here in the first uh, uh, in the first few slides or so, that uh, the Milky Way that we see in the Northern Hemisphere is not the same Milky Way they see in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, in fact, it is the same Milky Way, but it's visually, qu it's visually quite a different phenomenon uh, when we look at it in the Northern Hemisphere. So when we talk about the Milky Way, we're of course talking about our galaxy. We're located here. Uh, so we're not in the center of, of our galaxy, rather we're on one side of it. If we, look at, if we think about the shape of that Milky Way, 
Uh, we see that it's not like a single big ball, but rather it's more shaped like a plate so that if we begin to turn it on its side, it begins to take on the appearance from distance, uh, from distant space of a, of a plate-like structure. Uh, so, and, uh, so that when we're, uh, when we look up at the Milky Way down on Earth, we see the Milky Way passing through the sky as a single line. Uh, now, what's important about this and what's important about the point of how we see the Milky Way in the Northern Hemisphere versus how they see it in the Southern Hemisphere is that, of course, the Earth is tilted on its axis. And uh, so we have a certain view of our galaxy, and it's a view that's uh, really quite different than uh, those people see in the uh, uh, Southern Hemisphere. From the southern hemisphere, the view they see is looking towards essentially the center of our galaxy. Uh, so it's the view that we see in this direction through the center of the galaxy. So we're looking through a very dense array of stars. Where we're situated in our galaxy, we uh, look through a portion of the Milky Way that has uh, a much lesser number of stars uh, within our galaxy. So that, in fact, the view that we get, this is a sort of rollout photo mosaic view of the total line of the Milky Way through the skies. We see it here on Earth. But uh, you have to be in the southern hemisphere uh, in order to see that portion from about here over to here. We in the northern hemisphere see from about here to there, and then if we pull this total line into a circle, we see from about here to there and there to there. So the brightest stars in the Milky Way, the most spectacular view of the Milky Way, is seen only when you cross the equator and go into the southern hemisphere. The south celestial pole is located about there. And it's very important in terms of what I'll be talking about to recognize that the, the line, so what we call the line of the Milky Way through the sky, passes through the sky at a point about 23 degrees south of the of the axis of rotation of our Earth. So you see there the point more or less of the south celestial pole. Uh, there's no south star like Polaris that marks the south celestial pole. It's empty, it's black. Uh, but uh, uh, there is a distance of about 23 degrees from the, the uh, point of the axis of rotation, so the south celestial pole point and the line of the Milky Way. So that as the Earth spins on its axis, the Milky Way, uh, the axis of the Milky Way, since it does not coincide with the axis of rotation of the Earth, but rather is sl uh, slanted to it by about 23 degrees or so, that one actually sees when the Milky Way stands overhead in the zenith, we see one or the other of the two sides or the branches of the Milky Way. We see either one side that goes from the northeast uh, to the southwest, or if we're at that point, say, immediately under here, and as our Earth turns 12 hours later, we see the other arm of the Milky Way that goes then from the northwest to the southeast. So over time, we see this alternating, this alternation of axes between the northeast, southwest, northwest, southeast, of the, of the line of the Milky Way through the sky. And we'll see that this alternation, these two arms or these two views of the Milky Way were uh, central to the cosmological traditions that we'll be talking about. The other thing we'll see is that the Milky Way is very often thought of as a river and in a lot of the metaphorical commentaries about the Milky Way and, and statements about it, claims made about it in the various mythological traditions, it is very often likened to a great river uh, like those uh, uh, many rivers of the Amazonian forest that cut through the uh, cut through the forest of the Amazon. When we look first at the tradition of the Desana Indians, who are also Tucano peoples, Tucano-speaking peoples of Colombia, uh, they have a very uh, complex cosmological tradition, which has been described in a in a very important work by Gerardo Reichel Domatov, Amazonian Cosmos. Uh, what we learn from Reichel Domatov's work is that the Desana universe consists essentially of three super imposed cosmic zones, the upper or celestial zone, the intermediate zone or our earth, um, uh, and the lower zone of paradise. The most important structural component of the upper zone of the cosmos is the Milky Way. The Milky Way is conceived of as a, as a large skein of fibers of the Kumare palm. 
uh, that floats in a turbulent current arching over the earth. This current comes from the lower zone uh, flowing from east to west. The fibers of Kumari, which are yellowish or whitish, symbolize sperm among the Desana, and the Milky Way is commonly interpreted as an immense seminal flow that fertilizes all of the intermediate zone or the underlying biosphere. The Milky Way is as well the zone of communication where contact between terrestrial beings and supernatural beings is established. These contacts are obtained primarily through the use of hallucinogenic drugs, uh, and the Milky Way uh, itself is uh, directly designated as the zone of hallucinations and visions into which the shaman and other persons who take hallucinogenic drugs can penetrate and then pass from one cosmic level to the next. On the other hand, it's also important to note that the Milky Way is the dwelling place of sickness. It can be thought of as a large rising river in whose turbulent and foaming waters float residue and waste. Uh, these are the essences of putrefaction and consequently uh, they are very dangerous pathogenic factors for living beings. Uh, the sun, I would just note, is an important component of this uh, cosmology as well and the principal energy of the sun constitutes a huge closed circuit in which the entire biosphere participates. The Desana imagined this circuit as having a fixed quantity of energy that flows eternally between man uh, an animal between society and nature. The Desana designate this circuit of energy by the term Boga, and this word can be translated as current, and it is identified itself with the Milky Way. Uh, so going on to look at another of these tropical forest traditions in Colombia, uh, we move from the Desana, uh, who are located here, to the Barasana, uh, to the west of them, uh, on another river system, but one whose waters then flow from west to east into that great watershed that collects into the northern tributaries of the Amazon uh, River Basin. Uh, the universe among the Barasana is believed to be composed of three basic layers, as with the uh, Desana, the sky, the earth, and the underworld, and these are modeled on the long houses that the Barasana live in, so there's the front view of one of these uh, long houses. Uh, although all stars are said to be, uh, uh, here's a drawing of the stars in the constellations by a uh, Barasana shaman. Although all stars are said to be people, only some are selected to be given names and individual identities. And of these, most lie along the path of the Milky Way, or what's known as the star path. The Milky Way is variously described as being a reflection of the Milk uh, River on Earth uh, or a continuation of that river in the sky. The Milky Way, uh, 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 the Milk River on Earth is a huge river in the east that's often identified uh, with the Amazon and the Rio Negro. Uh, water flows downstream to the east uh, on land uh, where it is taken up into the sky by the Milky Way and is brought down again uh, on the other side in the west. As the constellations rise, they take up water from the earth to cause a dry season, and as they come down again, they bring celestial water as rain. Uh, though the overall path uh, of the stars for the Barasana, uh, obviously, is east to west, uh, the diagonal orientation of the Milky Way with respect to the ecliptic serves to divide the star path into two segments, a new path uh, and an old path and these coincide with these two axes of the Milky Way so the new star path there and the old star path there. Each star path has a focal constellation. The, st uh, the star, what's called the star thing or the Pleiades uh, is the leader of the new path which you see to the right. It's the most important constellation in the Barasana zodiac. We'll return to the Pleiades much later with the Inca. As the woman shaman who is the, who, uh, who is the sky, the creatress and the first shaman, the Pleiades regulate the seasonal, agricultural and ritual calendars. The new path uh, is in the sky during the dry season when the Pleiades sets in the west at dusk and this marks the end of the dry season and the beginning of the rainy season. Uh, if the connotations of the star path as we've just, uh, the new path are positive, uh, those of the old path to the left there are uh, equally negative. The first four constellations of this are spider, scorpion, snake, and caterpillar, jaguar. These are all poisonous creatures. 
And in addition to being poisonous, these creatures are also believed to be the vehicles uh, and, the, uh, 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 and the agents of sorcery. The old path is described as old, worn out, and decayed as its stars, uh, uh, and its stars is bad. And this is consistent with the fact that they dominate the sky during the rainy season when there is much sickness. So for both the Dasana and the Barasana, the Milky Way is the principal object orienting time, celestial space, and cosmological symbolic values. Uh, these values are built around dual opposed principles of fertility, creation, and health on the one hand, and poison, sorcery, and sickness on the other. The universe, according to this view, these views uh, is held in the balance between positive and negative forces, between fertility and sickness. The Milky Way is the object in the visible universe that signals and is most directly responsible for the eternal cyclical balancing of these opposed forces in the universe. So these are two views, some of the best views that have been described by ethnographers working with various peoples in the tropical forest of the Amazon. Let's turn now to the Inca Empire and to their descendants, the Quechua speakers of present-day Ecuador, um, uh, uh, Peru, and uh, Bolivia primarily. So the uh, Inca Empire was known as Tawantinsuyu, the four parts intimately bound together. So this was the great empire that stretched from the border between present-day Ecuador and Colombia, down through Peru, through Bolivia, northwest Argentina, and down through central Chile. It was divided into four parts, uh, or, or those four suyus that you see in the map on the left there. And it was articulated by a very complicated road system that you see in the map on the right, the famous Kapaknyan, the road system of the Inca Empire. The world of the uh, Incas of Tawantinsuyu uh, was conceived of as a world uh, that, was, that was laid out as a unified whole, as we just saw before, uh, divided into four parts. This is a map from a native chronicler named Wamampoma de Ayala, uh, who worked at the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century. And this is his uh, version of the Mapa Mundi, the map of the universe, uh, showing here the uh, 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 the, the Pacific Ocean at the bottom with the various sea creatures here, the Andes Mountains at the back, the whole of the empire divided into the four quarters, and with various creatures floating through the sky here. And I think this may have been uh, Wamampoma's own understanding of the, of the uh, 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 extraordinary number and very complex creatures that uh, pass through the sky in the Milky Way, which I'll explain later. We have other representations of the cosmological features of the Inca universe. Uh, as they understand it in a 17th century chronicle. This is a page from that chronicle that contains a drawing that was said to be a drawing that was painted on a wall of the church of the building known as the Cori Cancha, which was the, called the Temple of the Sun, the most sacred temple in the city of Cusco. When we look at what's included on the map as central elements of the Inca cosmos, we see a number of features uh, on the left top, the sun, uh, 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 on the right we see a cross of stars which is in the center, then a, a large ellipse called the Vida Cocha over on the right, and the sun on the left is balanced by the moon on the right, the Venus of the morning is on the left, the Venus of the evening on the right, etc. And you see a number of those features. Essentially what we see is that the map, the universe is composed of this balanced opposition between a number of units linked to males, so there's a human couple in the center there, uh, the king and the queen, so we have the sun linked to and balanced by the powers of the moon, uh, uh, the Venus of the morning linked to that of the evening, and a set of other features on either side. On the left, we have the Pleiades, again, important in those other tropical forest cosmologies, rainbow, lightning, and on the right, we have a lake, we have uh, a, a dark cloud, which I'll come back to, and the ancestral tree, and uh, uh, then storehouses. Uh, the most important identities in the Inca universe were, uh, 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 were the Inca king and uh, the queen, who from the 10th Inca onward was his sister. So there was a brother-sister marriage practiced at a certain point in the dynasty of the Incas. Uh, the Inca was considered to be the uh, divine and the descendant of the sun. Yeah. <laughs> 
the Inca upon death uh, was mummified and the bodies of the Incas uh, were kept in mummified form uh, in the order of their death in the Coricancha, in the Temple of the Sun, and they were brought out and paraded around the Inca capital of Cusco on ceremonial occasions. And they were fed and given drink, etc. So these were very important objects, very important entities in the universe. But, uh, the, and so they stood at the hierarchy, actually, of what was a whole world of sacred things that populated the Inca landscape and the Inca universe. Here we see another drawing by this uh, native chronicler, Wamampoma, showing the Inca king and queen at a mountain, at a sacred place, uh, which was being worshipped. The universe was alive with these sacred places that the Quechua knew, that the Quechua and the Inca knew as huacas. Uh, so those are sacred places and we have in one colonial document here a drawing of the Incas worshipping the sacred stones, uh, the carved stones. These all were organized throughout the empire in very complicated systems of alignments of wakas or alignments of sacred places. These alignments are called sekis and we'll come back a little later and talk about the very complicated system of this whole alignment of sacred places in the capital city of Cusco because it's intimately connected with how they understood the cosmos. But so, several of those lines were projected outside the valley of the capital through the empire. One of the most central ones was a line that went from the city of Cusco, the capital up here, down to Tiwanaku, which was the, uh, uh, um, which was the capital of a former pre-Inca empire, where the Incas considered uh, not only their ancestors to have originated, but for all of but of all things in the universe to have originated as well. And it's just important to point out here that that axis from Cusco down to Tiwanaku uh, coincides with a river called the, Col, uh, called the Vilcanota River, and it was conceived of, it was metaphorically thought of as one of these great axes of the Milky Way. At uh, Lake Titicaca, as I said, this was the origin place of some of the most important uh, objects that made up the universe, beginning with the sun. So here's a rock on an island in Lake Titicaca, uh, 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 and the island of which is called the Island of the Sun. And if you see that crack in the rock, that's actually the origin place of the sun. That's where the sun came. And so this was one of the most important sanctuaries for the Incas in their worship of the sun. Priests made that pilgrimage down the Wilcanota River once a year and back to Cusco. In thinking about Inca and then later Quechua and Dian astronomy, we need to recognize the fact that here we're in the south celestial hemisphere, so we want to see the universe turn completely upside down from the way we normally think of it. We have some statements in the Spanish Chronicles to the effect that the Incas wanted to actually carry their empire to the equator. So, and that's, a, that's about how far the empire extended. They were interested in the place where the sun sat most comfortably uh, between the right and the left uh, from its extreme rise points over the course of the year. Uh, so we are wholly within the southern hemispheres uh, uh, in the Inca empire. And again, then we are looking at that uh, visual manifestation of the Milky Way that's quite different from the one we see here. Uh, this is a tropical system of astronomy in the sense that as they are located between the Tropic of Cancer in the north and the Tropic of Capricorn in the south, the sun passes overhead in the zenith two times a year, once when it's moving to the south and once when it's moving back to the, to the north. And the Inca calendar system was built around observations of the solar extremes, the, the June solstice and then the point when the sun moved from there through the uh, point directly underground, they were also interested in that, through the equinox to the December solstice, and then when the two times a year when it passed through uh, this zenith point. So we know their solar observations were quite complicated. Uh, when we go back to this drawing of the, uh, uh, of the one chronicler in the 17th century, we can ask what is this great ellipse? And my theory has been for some time that it is a representation of the great line of the Milky Way. So I, in my own research, I did uh, research and uh, wrote my doctoral dissertation actually on the astronomical system of people in a village in Mishmanai, Peru. Uh, and in that village, they do recognize uh, this uh, uh, matter of the 
Milky Way having these two uh, diagonal orientations when it passes through the zenith. So one northeast, southwest, the other northwest, southeast. And on the basis of that then, uh, in that village of Mishmanai, they have four roads that pass through the village which they conceptually link to the four-part division of the community. Those roads are conceptually extended to the horizon, each to meet a point where the sun uh, uh, at its extremes, at the solstice, either rises or sets, and those then are linked to the sky by these two uh, diagonal axes of the Milky Way. So the whole thing, this is why I call my book at the crossroads of the earth and the sky in the community. It's thought of as this place that links these uh, uh, these terrestrial axes and the celestial axis as well. And uh, the, uh, uh, then they conceive of that river of the Wilkanota River as the earthly manifestation of the uh, celestial river, uh, the Milky Way. And the Milky Way itself is known as Mayu or river, uh, so it's there. Um, the waters of the earth flow across the earth and they flow uh, down into uh, what, the what the Quechua conceive of uh, as a cosmic sea that encircles the earth. The Milky Way passes through the sky, goes underground and takes up water, carries the water back up into the sky, seeds the sky with water and that's the origin of rain. But the Milky Way also takes up a very fertile kind of mud from under the earth that's called Pachatira, which combines the Quechua and Spanish words for earth. This is very fertile, fecund earth. Uh, and it takes that up and takes it up into the sky. And we'll come back and see uh, what becomes of that a little later. But when we talk about that, uh, then we get into the matter of other objects that are represented in that drawing. A uh, cross of stars at the top of the drawing up here, and then a dark uh, 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 a spot, an animal drawn in black uh, 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 in the right center of the drawing. And these, I think, represent the two basic types of constellations in the Quechua universe, both of which are located along the line of the Milky Way. So again, uh, they see uh, their primary view of the Milky Way is this very bright section down here, and they recognize two different kinds of constellations. One is what a, 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 a one can call, they don't have a specific designation for it, star to star constellations. These are like our constellations made by conceptually uh, forming shapes in the sky by linking neighboring stars into shapes. They don't know, they don't recognize Centaurus and, and uh, 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 Cancer and Sagittarius and all the constellations we recognize. They have their own constellations uh, uh, which you see designated here in the line of the Milky Way. The Pleiades was a very important important constellation for them. As you see uh, in that uh, quotation then, uh, they were used to divine how good the agricultural uh, uh, crops would be during the year. But also there are uh, uh, streaks that cut through the Milky Way and these are actually, uh, these are clouds of interstellar dust. So they're not meteorological clouds, they're fixed clouds of interstellar dust. Uh, that cut through the Milky Way and that block our view of the stars in that direction. So these, uh, the Quechua recognize as a line of animals that pass through the sky that, that, that are located in the middle of the Milky Way. There's a snake and there's, there's a toad. Uh, there's a tinamu, which is like a partridge. There's a mother yama located here with her baby stretched out under her suckling. And then there's a fox that's trying to get at the baby uh, Yama and is being trampled on by the mother Yama. So there's a great uh, a drama that's going on in the sky and these constellations are made of that Pachatira, the fecund earth under uh, the world. Uh, and uh, these are considered the prototypical animals, the origin of those animals on the earth. Uh, so here's a, a statement from the 17th century uh, that we see that talks about this uh, mother Yama, the animator of Yama, moving through the middle of the sky. And we see her as a black spot uh, here. So these constellations, um, uh, people talk about them today, so I was able to collect information about them, but they were known in pre-Columbian times as well. So that we see in the 
map then several signs of a Milky Way based astronomical tradition in the Andes that went through the colonial period and that we can identify to the present day. Just in the last two minutes uh, here, let me talk about uh, the sort of grand synthesis of all of this, the calendar and astronomy. And this took place in the, the SECI system, which was the organization of the city of Cusco, uh, the political, social, and ritual organization of the city. I've talked about these lines of orientation of sacred places uh, of, of the Wakas, the sacred places of the Wakas, and the SECIs are the lines of orientation. In the Cusco system many of these lines were astronomically oriented uh, uh, and uh, uh, one uh, for instance uh, was uh, uh, viewed was went uh, went in the direction of the rise of the Pleiades as viewed from the Temple of the Sun uh, that most sacred uh, uh, temple in the city of Cusco and uh, this formed a part a sort of key component of the of the ritual calendar of the Incas when the Pleiades rose on the uh, uh, to the east in the first day at dawn they began the count of what were 328 sacred sites sacred uh, or wakas around the city of Cusco these are na actually named item by item, place by place in one colonial document. Each day was associated with one of these places. That was also linked to a lunar calendar of the sidereal lunar cycle of 27 and a third days. But this gives us 328 days. At the end of the count of 328 days, it happens that at the latitude of Cusco, the Pleiades disappears for 37 days. So you have the count then of the 328 days plus 37 that gives 365 days so that correlates the the, the ritual calendar with the uh, solar calendar and it's keyed to the Pleiades, one of those principal, uh, principal constellations of the, uh, of the Milky Way for the, for the Inca and that all then regulated the 12 annual festivals of the Inca calendar. So that in all three of the cosmological traditions that we've talked about, the, the Disana and Barasana in the tropical forest of Colombia and the Inca and then their descendant Quechua traditions in South America, uh, the uh, 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 earth is intimately linked with the sky and with the underworld and the agent of communication is the Milky Way. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Erden, for compressing an, an incredible amount of research and an extraordinary complex system into something that we can all understand. <clears throat> when a highly respected Anishinaabe elder performing a naming ceremony for our next speaker's son, the name bestowed meant revolving sky, referring to the circular movement of the sun, moon, stars, and seasons. <clears throat> this ancient knowledge came from watching the stars move to different regions of the night sky throughout the year and observing the relationship between seasonal changes and stellar movements. Michael Wasagijig Price is Anishinaabe and enrolled tribal member of the Wikwemekong First Nations. Through his son's naming ceremony, Michael felt a connection to the star world for the first time in his life and became obsessed in seeking out the star knowledge of his ancestors, the Anishinaabe people, also referred to as the Chippewa or Ojibwe. Michael has devoted his entire career to the preservation of indigenous knowledge and the success of tribally controlled community colleges in reservation communities. He has recently served as academic dean of White Earth Tribal and Community College located on the White Earth Reservation in Northwest Minnesota. In 2002, Michael authored an article entitled Anishinaabe Star Knowledge, <clears throat> which was a compilation of star stories and celestial knowledge of the Anishinaabe people. His presentation today is entitled Underwater Panthers, Thunderbirds, and Anishinaabe Star Knowledge. Please welcome Dr. Michael Wasagijig Price. Bonjour, Anin. Michael Price was a Gigi condition because we quimicong manitou minasindon jiba makwa nin to dem. 
Gawaba Bigani Kag in Dayan Nungam. Um, my name is Michael Price Wasagijik. I just introduced myself in my native language, the, the Anishinaabe. And sorry, I'm a little distracted here because it is light here. It's very bright. But uh, um, I worked at tribal colleges for most of my professional career, and I saw a huge need to to go out and to learn this knowledge and, and to try to revive it for, for the next generation of Anishinaabe students. A lot of them had never even knew of the, of the star, not that Anishinaabe people had their own star knowledge. And they never knew that, um, that there were philosophers and astronomers and great thinkers uh, within their ancestral community. And so part of the reason why I wanted to go on this journey was, was to, to try to bring back this knowledge as a gift to them and, uh, and to add to my work uh, as a faculty member. <clears throat> so the title of my presentation, Underwater Panthers, Thunderbirds, and Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe Star Knowledge, I tried to pick out some of the stories that, 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 that really jumped out in, in, this, in this journey to, to learn the knowledge. And there's a whole lot more knowledge here that I didn't include. But um, I hope this kind of gives you a feel for, for how they seen and, and understood uh, the star world. So just, oh, thank you. So just to give you um, a little little idea of where the Anishinaabe people are from, here's a map of uh, Anishinaabe country, and if you see the uh, the large reservation down here, this this is the White Earth Reservation. This is where I live right now, um, but actually my family is from this large island right here in northern Lake Huron called Manitoulin Island. And that's where most of my uh, seven generations of my family are from. But all along the Great Lakes, all around the Great Lakes, is, is the land of the Anishinaabe people. Um, also the Cree, the, uh, the Odawa, the Chippewa, or the Ojibwe, uh, the Menominee. We are all Anishinaabe people uh, in that nation. So I'm going to uh, share with you some of the, the star stories. And I know that you'll recognize some of these, these constellations. And what became really fascinating to me was when I, I've always known these as the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, but when I began to hear these names spoken in the Ojibwe language, it was really exciting for me uh, to have learned this knowledge. So we'll start with the, um, what most of us have seen as the, uh, or know as the Big Dipper. And this is what we call in Ojibwe, Ojig. Ojig is a, uh, a member of the weasel family. It is a carnivore that lives in the forest. Uh, it has a long tail and a very respected hunter um, that, that, the, that the Anishinaabe recognize. And here's a picture of an actual fisher that, that lives in the North Woods. A very beautiful animal, and it is actually one of the only mammals that, that has the ability to hunt and kill porcupines. So it uh, has that gift that no other uh, carnivorous mammal has. But going back to this story, uh, the fisher, and I want to try to, to tell the story in the way that I've heard it told to me, uh, the story of how the fisher uh, got the arrow in its tail. A long time ago, um, when the springs came and the trees began to green up, this was back in a time when the animals could communicate to one another. Um, a lot of the animals realized that the birds did not return one year. And so a lot of the animals were concerned and they began to gather together and ask one another, why haven't the birds returned this year? And then the bear looked up in the sky and, and saw that the birds were being, were flying up into a hole in the sky, or what we call a bagunagizik. And that the, the birds were flying into the hole and they were disappearing. And so the animals gathered together and they began to ask one another, we need to investigate and see what's happening to our relatives, the birds. So they went and found the tallest cedar tree they could find in the forest. And then they began to deliberate with one another. Well, who's going to climb this tree and investigate? So among all of the tree climbing mammals, they all got together and talked and the bear said, well, I can't because I'm too big. And the porcupine said, well, I can't because I'm too timid. And all the animals 
found reasons why they couldn't do it. And finally, the fisher, Ojig, said, I'll climb up there and I will find out what is going on, what is happening to the birds. So the fisher began to climb the cedar tree and climb to the very tops of his limbs until finally the limbs are so thin that it became wobbly. And then with one great leap, the fisher jumped from the top of the trees and into the Bhaganagizhik, the hole in the sky. And now the fisher was in the cloud world. And what the fisher found was that this angry cloud spirit was holding the birds captive. It had hundreds of thousands of birds that it held captive inside these small clouds. And this angry cloud spirit kept forming more clouds which to, to trap more birds. So finally the little fisher ran up to one of those clouds and began to spin its tail and he dissolved one cloud. And finally a whole flock of birds flew away, flew in through the Bhaganagizhik and back to earth. Then the little fisher began to release more birds and more birds. And he was working, spinning his tail to dissolve these clouds and, and, the, and the birds were escaping back down to earth. Well, finally, the angry cloud spirit saw what the fisher was doing. And the angry cloud spirit reached in and grabbed a bow and an arrow and shot at the fisher. But the fisher just kept spinning his tail and kept dissolving these clouds, releasing all the birds, until finally the last cloud that was released, the birds flew through the hole in the sky, and the little fisher ran for the hole in the sky as well. And just as the fisher began to leap through the hole, an arrow hit the fisher in the tail, and he lunged and grabbed for the top limb and missed it. And the poor fisher fell to the earth, and unfortunately he died. A lot of the animals and the birds, they gathered around the, the little fisher's body, and they recognized the bravery that this little animal had done to bring back the birds of the spring. And the great spirit was watching this whole scenario take place. So the great spirit reached down onto the earth and picked up nine stones and threw them into the sky. And those stones formed a star constellation that would always immortalize and, and remember the bravery that the fisher did in bringing back the birds. So that's the story of Ojig, the fisher. And these, oh, thank you. Miigwech. So the two stars that you see in his tail are, are very dim, but they're there. And so the, this, a very prominent star constellation and a story among the Anishinaabe people. The next constellation that I want to bring up was the Mang, or the, or the Great Northern Loon. And this is actually the Little Dipper upside down. And if you look at it, it looks exactly like a loon floating on top of the water. And, of course, here is a picture, for those of you who haven't seen the Great Loon up close, uh, this is a picture of Mang. And if you notice um, the, the, the spots in, on the loon's back, they say that the people that are born of the Loon clan actually have a, a connection to the star world, and it is represented on the, the, on the loon's back. So those are star representations uh, on the back of the loon. And of course, here's the two constellations together. A story that I learned from Bob Jourdain was that Polaris, which is the North Star, is actually in the Ojibwe language called Oji Ganung, which is the, uh, the Fisher Star. And throughout the year, the Fisher constellation will, evo will revolve around the North Star all throughout the year. The Fisher constellation will be in different parts of the sky in different parts of the season, and a lot of Anishinaabe people were able to read uh, that, that movement, just like a clock. So I know many of you will probably know this constellation. The tail of the, or, or the head of Leo is actually the, the tail of the, the great underwater panther, Mishia Bijou. And this is a very formidable spirit among the Anishinaabe people. This is a spirit that lives underneath the waters and wherever there's turbulent water or whirlpools, they say that's where these panthers reside. And a lot of Anishinaabe people, before they went out in their canoes, they gave tobacco, asema, to the spirits for a safe journey and basically to appease these spirits that they wouldn't capsize their canoes and, and pull them underneath the water. 
So this is a very formidable um, uh, spirit that uh, the Anishinaabe people respect. And this is the constellation. This is actually a spring constellation that comes up, um, I believe, in, at the end of March. And what's ironic about that time is that that's about the time that the ice is beginning to break up and melt uh, in the north, northern part of uh, Minnesota. And so it becomes very dangerous up there during that time where there's thin ice. And so we always recognize uh, that this constellation, it, it tells us to, to be careful and to be cautious when we're out on the waters and to always uh, give tobacco to appease uh, those spirits. So these are some rock paintings. And for those of you that have toured around Canada on the north shore of Lake Superior have probably seen this. This is the great Mishibiju that's painted on the, the rocks um, on uh, Agawa Bay, uh, northern Lake Superior. <clears throat> and you can see the, the horns and the, and the spikes. I mean, it, it was made to be a very formidable uh, spirit. And if you look over on the far left, you'll see a canoe that's full of people. And of course, down below, I asked an elder what those two uh, beings were below the Mishibiju. And he said those is what I, what I would call Zagasqua Jemeg, or giant leeches. So this pictograph that I believe was meant to be a warning, and the little picture down on the right there, that's my little boy at the, at the rock painting site. And if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the rocks here, right up here is where the painting is. And down here is just kind of this, this rock uh, slant. And when the waves are really high, uh, it's very dangerous out there. And, and if somebody was to fall off into that water when the waves were up, it would be life-threatening. And I believe that's why that these ancient uh, people uh, put this painting here as, as a warning to be careful uh, in, this, in this area. Of course, the day that we took this, this picture, it was a nice, calm day. But the day before, uh, we could have never gotten out there because it was really dangerous. This is another rock painting of a Mishibiju uh, uh, near um, up in the Boundary Waters uh, uh, wilderness area in northern Minnesota. This is probably almost 200 miles from the other painting at, at Agawa Bay. And as you can see, it's starting to fade a little bit, but you can see the long tail that comes over its back, and you can see the two horns uh, coming off of its head. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of the rock is beginning to chip away. So uh, it, I don't know how much longer we'll be able to have and, and see these paintings with the rock the way it's flaking as it is. And this is obviously a very old uh, rock painting. This is another underwater spirit uh, that the Ojibwe recognize, Mishigenebik, which is the underwater serpent. And again, you can see that these, these small symbols over here are canoes. And then, of course, there's a moose, which is a, an aquatic uh, uh, mammal. But that this is another formidable spirit that should be uh, recognized and, and, and much caution must be given uh, to this area where these, where these symbols are found. This is at Darkey Lake in the, in the Quetico Provincial Park. This is extremely remote. It takes almost two days a canoe up to this rock painting, an extreme remote area. The great thunderbird, as I mentioned, the, the Monsieur Bijou is an underwater spirit. We say that that is a spirit of the underworld. Well, this is the spirits of the sky world, a Nimki Benesi. And this is the constellation Cygnus. And there's all kinds of stories in Ojibwe uh, spirituality about battles between the sky world and the underworld. I know a lot of people thought that that our stories were about peace and harmony and balance, but actually there's a lot of battles that goes on between these different realms, these different entities in our, in our spiritual world. And over here on the left are some paintings of, of, of the great Thunderbird. Um, these, were paint, these again were painted all over the, uh, the rock outcroppings along northern, uh, in Ontario and northern Minnesota. And this was a nice cloud picture that I found that, that looked exactly like a thunderbird. We always look for cloud formations that, 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 uh, that tell us those things. 
But this is a, a nim ki benesi. This is the, the spirits of, of the skies. And just this last year in northern Minnesota, in June, we had these tremendous floods that went on in Duluth and, and wiped, it took out a lot of bridges and, and, and it destroyed a lot of roads. A tremendous uh, flood that, that we had there. And then we had a lot of dry, uh, we, we had kind of a semi drought time during that, uh, throughout the summer. And then in July, we had a huge windstorm that hit Bemidji, Minnesota and knocked over thousands of trees uh, all the way from across the Leech Lake Reservation all the way to Duluth. And a lot of these uh, uh, tribal elders uh, that know these stories said, uh, the Thunderbirds are, are, are upset with us. In our creation stories, we know that the Thunderbirds were created to nurture and protect the earth. They nurture the earth by bringing the winds and the rains uh, that the earth needs. But we've also been instructed too that the Thunderbirds were instructed to protect the earth and that they would protect the earth from humans if needed. And I heard that story quite a while ago and I got to thinking about climate change and, and how we've, we've made changes to the earth and how now the Thunderbirds, according to those teachings, are coming back on us. And so this has got a lot of uh, people talking uh, on the different uh, reserves about uh, these Thunderbird teachings and, and some of the uh, dialogue around climate change and some of these storms that we've been seeing here recently. This is a painting by Norval Morso from 1965 who, who talked about the battles between the sky world and the underworld. And of course, this is a Thunderbird battling an underwater serpent. And Norval Morrisow was one of the first artists to actually capture uh, these types of spiritual teachings. And the Anishinaabe people back in those days were really, I think they were upset with him that he began to put these types of teachings on, on canvas. But nonetheless, I mean, it, it, uh, it sparked a, a renaissance in this type of cultural knowledge uh, through his paintings and through his artwork. I know we've talked a lot of, about this, conver this constellation. Many of us grew up seeing this one uh, in the wintertime, known as Orion the Great Hunter. In the Anishinaabe tradition, this is Nanabojo, or Nanabush, our trickster spirit. And this is uh, one of the most probably prominent winter constellations. And it's a tradition in the Native American community that we do not tell Nanabojo stories until the snow is on the ground. And as you know, when Orion rises, uh, it should be rising in another couple weeks, when it begins to rise in the eastern skies, that's usually about the time that the snow begins to fall. And then throughout the winter months, in the early evenings, Orion will make its way across the skies until about early March, and then that's when Orion begins to uh, sink below the western horizon. And by that time, spring is on its way. So Orion, um, uh, one of our more prominent uh, star constellations, that this knowledge was almost lost. A lot of Anishinaabe people didn't know the stories of these constellations. And of course, here is a pictograph at uh, Hegman Lake, uh, just north of Ely, Minnesota. And a lot of elders say that this is uh, a depiction of Nanabojo and his connection to uh, the animal world. And of course, as you see right above uh, Nanabojo's head are these canoe symbols again that we see all across uh, um, this area, uh, the, these types of rock paintings. This is probably one of the star stories that probably caught my attention the, the most. And the Wolverines, they don't live in Minnesota anymore. In fact, because of deforestation and trapping of the wolverines have have been eradicated from the state of minnesota but the, but the stories and the traditions uh, among anishinaabe people are still there so our name for the wolverine is guingua age which means the one who came from a falling star and in this story it talks about how a star actually fell from the sky and hit the earth and when it hit the earth, it caused a huge explosion and knocked a hole in the earth. And over time, the Anishinaabe people would not go to this hole, but they would watch it from a distance. And over a few years, this hole eventually turned into a lake. 
And then one day a young Ojibwe hunter was walking by and he seen a mammal that came out of the waters of this lake. And this mammal had a very vile temper. It was very aggressive and chased the, the hunter away. And it, it was very much of a lone uh, spirit. It walked alone, it, it, it stayed alone. And so the Anishinaabe people called this animal the one who came from the falling star because they remembered that when the star hit the earth and formed that lake, that was the lake that this mammal arose from. And that story really stuck with me because I believe in oral tradition, um, the Anishinaabe people recorded a, a meteorite impact uh, within their stories, and that story has been preserved through the name of the, of the wolverine, Gwingwa Age. And this is another story that I recently found out about, Nuwachige Anung. And again, this is a story that talked about Back in our, some of our creation stories, there was a story about how the first burning of the earth and how the earth, a star had hit the earth and caused a massive destruction, had destroyed thousands of trees and had, had wiped out many animals and people during that time. And the story was that people were not living well. People were killing other people. Mammals were killing other mammals. The water was, was, was not good. It was a bad time for the people. So from the star world came the star to cleanse the earth and to bring it back into balance. And so when the star hit the earth, that was the story of the first burning of the earth. But one thing that was told um, in the Midday Society was that this star comes back to check on us to see how we're living as people and to see that we are living in a good way and that we are taking care of the earth. And this star comes to check on us every approximately 75 years. And that star is what we know as Halley's Comet. Nuachige Anung. Another name for Halley's Comet is, is Wazuwa Danung, which is the long-tailed star. And so this is passed down through the Medewin teachings um, in order to instruct people to live in a good way and, and, to, and to always do their ceremonies and, 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 and follow the, the ways of the Mede uh, for a good life. And that we know that one day this star will be coming back to check on us. And the last time it was here, I believe it was uh, 1985. So... Um, so... There's a lot more star stories that I did not introduce here. Uh, these are some of the, uh, uh, the ones that really stick out for me uh, while I've been on this journey to learn this knowledge. But I wanted to say miigwech to all the people that I had learned these star stories from, from Bob Jourdain, from Kuchiching First Nations, Tobasanaquit Kanyu from Onigaming First Nations, Carl Gaboy from Boys Fort in Minnesota, um, Norva Morso, who is probably one of the most gifted Anishinaabe artists uh, to ever live, and Thor Conway, a, a tribal historian. I'd like to thank the National Museum of the American Indian for inviting me here to share these stories, and, and I just feel very honored to be able to come and share these with, with everyone else. And i also like to thank Leech Lake Tribal College, who actually gave me the time as a faculty member to go and to learn ethnoastronomy and ethnobotany on my own time as well. So if it hadn't been for these tribally controlled community colleges, um, I wouldn't have found the time probably to, to do this work. So, aho, miigwech. Thank you, Michael, for that wonderful presentation. <clears throat> we are at this time going to take a 10 minute break. For those of you who need to use the restroom or, like me, need to go cough somewhere. <clears throat> uh, so let us uh, regroup back here. We will start promptly on time uh, at about 3.15. Thank you.
<laughs> so the battery must have died on this. I'm glad you turned it upside yeah. down. This is one, you know, upstairs on the, uh, on the um, fourth floor near the computer there. I mean, the fifth floor. It's the office clock. <laughs> But, yeah, you know what it is, it's the battery. Because it's right. ticking, yeah, it's ticking, but it's, it's not moving. keeping time. What it is, is the battery is old, that must so be it's it. dying. Um, so we'll put this, I'll take it back upstairs to its home. Would you like to use my cell phone? I have a cell phone. Because what, see, oh, I see, what you like do that. is press that, yeah, <coughs> which is what I do. You can do like, all you do is you press right here. Right and there. Then, yeah, and then it'll go off. Then when you want to, you just press that and change I mean, I can do there. mine for my time, because we don't even need to end the watch. Right, because um, you have two more speakers, and right. this, yeah, what well, you're here, so you can <coughs> tell them, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, and okay. so um, I'm going to have to call a cab for uh, for Gary. For Gary, yeah, because he's going to leave for them. I'm going to take this upstairs. I'm going to buy my own clock <laughs> instead of borrowing the office clock again. All right. So Thank it's you. going beautifully. Yeah. There.
three to six, the one at the beginning, yep. back up that. Makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's up to you to sort of uh, okay. monitor yourself. We did have a clock sitting. Mm -hmm. It's up to mine. The tenant is speaking. Okay. Yeah. Very good. <coughs> yep. 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 Have a seat back there. Or, uh, you go ahead and set up. Do I have to clear from this? Yeah, we could put on the first one because I don't actually talk to that. Okay. It's that big blue one. Mm hmm. Right, and you can just refresh me. This this is the, uh, the, the, room was the, the, the laser. pointer. Yep, yep. Don't point it at the audience, and this turns it. Yep. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Very good. Step back. Here okay. So well. I have to. Uh, the cab company is going to call me when Gary's cab is here. Okay. So if you guys are still Q and A, mm -hmm. which you may not be, I will go there and I'll uh, from that side of the stage. I'll give a sign saying the cab is here. Okay. And you can just say something about Gary has to go. Okay. Very good. You got a new battery for that phone? Taking it upstairs and see if they have it oh. Okay, very good. <clears throat> Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to Stellar Connections. Our next speaker is John McDonald. Now retired, John McDonald spent most of his working life in the Canadian Arctic. He, for 25 years, coordinated the Iglulik Research Center located in the Inuit community of Iglulik in Nunavut's North Baffin Island region, and I can't believe I got that out of my mouth without blowing it. Throughout his time in Iglulik, he collaborated closely with local Inuit elders to record and document the oral history <coughs> and traditional knowledge of the region. Part of this work included a major study of Inuit astronomy and cosmology, leading to the publication of his wonderful book, The Arctic Sky, Inuit Astronomy, Star Lore, and Legend. Long interested in contact history between Europeans and the Inuit, John is currently editing and annotating an unpublished journal documenting early encounters between the Inuit of the Iglulik area and members of an 1820s British naval expedition seeking a Northwest Passage from the Atlantic to the Pacific. John's presentation is entitled after his book, The Arctic Sky, Inuit Astronomy, Star Lore and Legend. Please welcome John McDonald. Uh, th thank you, Doug. I uh, these lights are bright, eh? Yes, yes they are. Yeah, <clears throat> it's like the midnight sun. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> again, and also thank you for uh, uh, plugging the book. It's available on Amazon, by the way. Uh, but I should point out that the, the, the proceeds go to two things, the Royal Ontario Museum, and also to uh, support an oral history project in the community in which I lived all these years. Uh, I'm also grateful f to be invited here. Uh, it's many years since I've been to Washington, and the last time I was simply passing through. Uh, I'm going to be here for approximately a week, so because uh, I was brought here, so to speak, by the Smithsonian, uh, I'm going to hang on and uh, go through the museums uh, as much as I can. So thanks very much.
what happened? <laughs> there. There, sorry. <clears throat> Good, getting these bugs. It, it, it's probably very clear to us all now that uh, cultural astronomies are about particular people in particular places. So first a few words about Inuit and their Arctic homelands. Inuit, and I name this, and I use the name to include the, uh, the Yukpik uh, in the western part of the Arctic. Inuit live mainly in the Arctic regions of North America, Greenland, and even have a toehold in parts of uh, Alaska. Excuse me, a toehold in parts of northeastern Siberia. The blue areas on the map indicate uh, approximately their traditional homelands. They're predominantly coastal dwellers, although a few groups live within the margins of the tree line, notably in parts of Alaska, northern Quebec, and Labrador. Coastal Inuit traditionally lived on marine mammals such as seals, walrus, and whales, while those living inland relied almost exclusively on caribou. Diet was augmented seasonally by fish, migratory birds such as geese, ducks, and uh, also ptarmigan, and minimally by forage roots and berries in the summer. Over the past 60 years or so, Inuit have become more urbanized, moving from their camps on the land into crowded settlements established by national governments across the Arctic. This afternoon, we'll be looking mainly at the astronomy of the Inuit of Iglulik. They're also known by their own name as the Iglulingmiut who live on a small island in Canada's Nunavut territory. Iglulingmute star knowledge is shared by other Inuit communities in North Baffin Island, but at a general level, its uh, cosmological foundations are applicable across the entire Inuit range from the Bering Sea across Arctic America to the west and east coasts of Greenland. Iglulik, and uh, the Iglulik island is shown inset on the, uh, on the map on the screen, is just below 70 degrees north, placing it 300 kilometers above the Arctic Circle. The, winter here's, or, or the winters here are long and dark, and the sun is gone each year from the end of November until the middle of January. And the summers, while they're short and blessed with the midnight sun, are invariably short, and the ice-free season, even in these times of climate change, lasts around three months from late July to the end of October. In fact, uh, Iglulik, uh, as I speak, is, uh, is experiencing freeze-up, not like here. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Iglulik was established as a settlement by the Canadian government in the early 1960s, and is now a growing town of around 1,900 people, mostly Inuit. Before moving into the settlement, Inuit of the area lived in small seasonal camps on the coastal inlets of nearby Baffin Island, locations chosen for the predictability of the marine animals on which they depended. As you can see, the terrain around Iglulik tends to be rather flat and featureless compared to most other locations in the eastern Arctic. There are no mountains to obscure the horizon, and so a large and rather inviting sky is a hallmark of Iglulik scenery, which is very good for anyone that's interested in stars. Iglulik Island has an extremely rich archaeological heritage. The numerous remains of ancient dwellings scattered throughout the island have found their way into Inuit cosmology. Inuit tradition views these sites as having been occupied at a single time in the very distant past by the island's first people. This was at a time when there was no winter and no death. Life, it was said, was easy and food plentiful, but the island eventually became impossibly overcrowded the countless archaeological sites prove this, and people were literally being pushed into the sea. Legends tell that this desperate situation was eased only by people calling for death and winter. So death and winter came, social order was established, and the growth of the community checked. A version of this legend ends with the words, with death came the sun, the moon, and the stars 
For when people die, they go up to the heavens and become luminous. Uh, uh, archaeologists with a very different cosmology view the island sites as having been occupied by various Arctic hunting peoples over the last 4,500 years as the island gradually rebounded from the seas following the last ice age. My interest in Inuit astronomy came about perhaps inevitably as a result of a long-term residence in Iglulik. I was there with my family for almost 25 years. And it was also aided and abetted by my dabbling in the, in the very esoteric practice of uh, celestial navigation. During my observation sessions on clear winter nights, uh, and I'd be usually fumbling with a frozen sextant or a frozen uh, artificial horizon, older curious Inuit would often happen by point out a few of their stars, gently implying, or so I thought, that an understanding of the sky and the employment of its contents could be had without the use of my cumbersome gadgets. I took the hint and so began in 1985 a series of interviews with Inuit elders about their astronomy lasting intermittently over some 20 years. All this was part of a major oral history project sponsored by the Iglulik Elder Society. About 30 elders, three of the main contributors shown here, Noah Piogatuk, Rosi Akadliuk and Michel Kupak participated in the program. When interviewed about their astronomy, most insisted that the information they possessed was meager compared to that of their parents or grandparents. Nevertheless, it was clear that these elders were virtually the last keepers of a more or less detailed knowledge of their astronomical traditions. The rapid dilution of Inuit star knowledge is not surprising. The semi-urban life most Inuit now live hinders the transmission of traditional knowledge. Conditions readily conducive to learning about the celestial sphere have ceased to exist. In the old days, for example, slow-paced dog team journeys across the open tundra gave uh, excellent opportunity to learn about the sky. Nowadays, however, with their snowmobile travel, leaves very, very little inclination or enthusiasm for stargazing. Significantly, elders pointed out that they no longer notice the stars because of the glare of the community's street lights. Unfortunately, light pollution, the anathema of urban dwelling sky watchers everywhere, now pervades the Canadian Arctic. Inuit cosmology was based on shamanistic belief and observance and offered a view of the sky and its contents well suited to their spiritual and pragmatic needs. Their astronomy, particularly for those groups living above the Arctic Circle, reflects the unique appearance of the celestial sphere at higher latitudes, perhaps demonstrated most dramatically by the sun's absence from the sky during the midwinter months. The illustration on the screen is by Rinoaya Asivak, a well-known artist from Cape Dorset on Baffin Island. Rinoaya's image beautifully captures the Inuit perspective of the intimate relationship between the sky, its contents, and the earth. Unlike our view, which seems increasingly to expand the limits of space, Rinoaya's sky is actually contained by the earth. You'll notice, too, that her drawing is also about time, place, and activity. In effect, it's a calendar delineating the Arctic year, including the freezing and melting of sea ice, as well as the key activities associated with each of the seasons. Notice, too, that the sun's annual cycle is represented along the fringe of high mountains bordering the Earth. You can see the, the sun's annual cycle is represented around the edge of the, of the, of the drawing. Uh, 
Across the Arctic, the notion of a flat Earth was widely held. In Alaska, for instance, lost hunters were said to have fallen off the edge of the world, while in Labrador, such accidents were prevented by high cliffs, keeping anything from living going to the region beyond. The carving by Lucasi Utuanga on the left of the screen nicely illustrates the world's mountainous perimeter. The image on the right shows the legendary Misana at the end of the world, staring triumphantly into space, holding a string of brilliant beads, proof that he has reached the Earth's extremities. A widespread Inuit legend known from areas as far apart as Alaska and northern Quebec tells us that such beads are found only at the world's end. Earth and sky are analogous in the Inuit view, each in winter having a similar snow-clad topography. In the sky, the sun and moon live in adjoining igloos. Regular traffic took place between the two realms. Seamus, for instance, on their spirit flights would visit the moon, and the moon man, a protector of abused orphans, would come to the, moon, uh, would come to the earth to enforce taboos and to confer fertility on childless women. It was believed that taboo breaking was often responsible for the creation of celestial objects, and virtually all stars with human personifications were created following the commission of some grave social transgression. Murder and incest, as we shall see, are at the root of the epic Inuit legend recounting the creation of the sun and the moon. Because of Iglulik's high northern latitude, around 70 degrees north, the visible portion of the celestial sphere is noticeably less from what we see in the more temperate latitudes. In practical terms, for example, this means that the brightest star, Sirius, such an obvious feature of the late night sky in Washington just now, is barely seen at Iglulik. It literally creeps along the horizon. In contrast, the twin stars Castor and Pollux, which rise and set at Washington's latitude, are circumpolar, meaning that they are always above the horizon and can be seen any time during, during the hours of darkness in Iglulik, obviously, if there's no cloud cover. Inuit names for stars and star groupings fall into several categories. Uh, as I'm going through this, you can look at the names that they give various constellations uh, on the table there. The two principal ones are first human and animal personifications. The second intrinsic designations derived from some feature of the star in question, including, for instance, its spatial relationship to other stars, whether the star is leading or trailing, and in the case of the North Star, its apparently fixed position in the sky. Some have anatomical designations, the breastbone, which is what they call the Pleiades, and also the collarbones. Normally, only single stars are used by Inuit for personification of humans and animals. This practice is consistent with the widespread view that such stars were once animate beings on Earth, possessed of single souls, which in transformation logically retained their individual identities. The image on the screen shows a view of the sky as perceived by Iglulik Inuit. Almost all their major stars and constellations are represented here, including most obviously, sorry, including most obviously uh, Ursa Major. I mentioned the collarbones. Uh, these are four stars com uh, th that comprise our stars, Capella, Menkelin, and Castor, and Pollux. Uh, Cassiopeia has actually two designations. The three brightest stars in Cassiopeia are considered uh, pa uh, lampstands for a soapstone lamp. I've mentioned the Pleiades before, that's a breastbone. 
we'll hear more about uh, Aldebaran, which is the uh, polar bear, and the surrounding stars, the star cluster, the Hyades. Sirius uh, here is represented as, a, as an old woman cleaning her igloo window. She also has a, a, a lamp which apparently flickers each time people go between the moon and earth. Now, if any of you have seen the star Sirius at uh, lower latitudes, it's uh, extremely brilliant. Uh, some people have likened it to a cut diamond. It is full of prismatic figures changing all the time. And Inuit feel that, uh, that the draft of these passerbys cause the lamp to flicker thus. Myths and legends can serve a variety of purposes. From the arcane encoding of cultural values and expectations to explicit cautionary tales aimed at dissuading wayward behavior. Celestial legends same, share these same characteristics, but in addition are a practical device for making sense of the sky and its contents. Indeed, Iglulic elders say that the, one of the purposes of star stories is to help us remember the exact location of important stars used in time telling and in navigation or wayfinding. And incidentally, once Inuit do uh, tell you their stories about stars, they do tend to stick with you. They're less complex than some of the projections that uh, we tend to make on the sky. And the, the legend of Udlaktut stars, and these are the stars in, the, uh, in, in Orion, Udlaktut means uh, the runners, and it illustrates the point I've just made very well. The story involves the three main stars in Orion's belt and the prominent star Aldebaran, in the constellation Taurus, and finally a number of stars in the Hyades cluster. This legend relates that on a bright moonlight night, three brothers and their dogs come across a polar bear. They begin to hunt it. However, they are unaware that they have been seen by a woman who has recently given birth and is thus under various taboo restrictions, one of which prohibits her from looking at hunters. Breaking this taboo causes the three hunters, their dogs, and the polar bear to rise up to the sky where they're all transformed into stars. The three hunters become Orion's belt stars. Ahead of them is the polar bear, the star we know as Aldebaran, surrounded by the Hyades star cluster, which are now the hunters' dogs. There's a lovely embellishment of this story and, and that's the great nebula in Orion is sometimes said to be the children, and they're usually cousins of the hunters that are carrying fur clothing uh, to their fathers that are pursuing the polar bear. Now, those of you that have observed the, uh, the great nebula uh, in Orion will recognize that it's quite fuzzy and uh, stands in very well for fur clothing. Legends can also be seen as akin to hypothesis, offering an explanation for the way things are or seem to be. The Sun Mood legend provides an example. In its entirety, this legend is one of the most widespread and complex of all Inuit traditions. It is often abbreviated to relate how two siblings a brother and, uh, excuse me, a sister and her incestuous brother rise up to the sky to become the sun and the moon. In its fullest sense, this story is much more than this. It addresses universal concerns about creation, social and cosmic order, nourishment, retribution, and renewal. The concluding part of the narrative in which the sun and the moon are actually created goes like this. Long ago, before the sun, moon, and stars, when all was dark, a young woman alone in her igloo 
was repeatedly visited by a man who took advantage of her. Wishing to find out who this man was, she decided that the next time he visited, she would mark his face with soot from her extinguished lamp. On his next visit, she did just this, smudging his face with her sooty fingers. When he left, she followed him to a large igloo where people were celebrating. And there in the light of the oil lamps, she discovered to her horror that her visitor had been none other than her own brother. Distraught, she lit a torch of moss and rushed round the igloo. Her brother also lit a torch and followed her. Outside, they ran round and round the igloo in a clockwise direction, the sister leading, the brother following, until at last they ascended into the sky. Her torch grew brighter and brighter, but her brother's torch merely smoldered. She, in her brilliance, became the sun, and he the pale moon. Across the Arctic, key elements of this legend have been used by Inuit to explain a number of observed phenomena. For instance, the apparent motion of the sun across the sky from east to west is established in the clockwise direction of the chase round the igloo. The sister's brightly burning torch, compared to that of her brother's smoldering one, accounts for the difference in luminosity between the sun and the moon. The moon's dark patches are the smudged marks on the brother's face, and this illustration shows them as, as does this. The, the dark patches on the moon are, are suit. Solar eclipses result when the moon in his continuing pursuit of the sun, periodically catches up with his sister and embraces her again. Even the moon phases are explained. The sister, full of disgust at her brother's incest, stops giving him food. He gradually wastes away. Her pity evoked, she begins to feed her brother again, thereby restoring him to his former size. This cycle of revulsion and pity continues endlessly, hence the monthly waxing and waning of the moons. Inuit have no word for time, not at least in the abstract sense commonly understood in our industrial society. This does not mean, of course, that they somehow lacked any comprehension between the links of the links between time and so-called economic activity, a view too often attributed to cultures whose perceptions of time do not coincide with those of the Western world. Expressions dear to us like saving time, losing time, over time, time as money, uh, create all kinds of difficulties for Inuit translators. Uh, once at a conference uh, that was dealing with uh, uh, Inuit co-ops, a, a government advisor was trying to explain to Inuit that time cost money. Uh, the translator was really baffled and uh, gave it his best shot, uh, which was a watch costs a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and if I go on much longer, I'll be timed out by Doug here. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'll mention that, uh, that with the introduction of Christianity, uh, Inuit were introduced to uh, that rather unusual concept or division of time called a week. And on the right of the screen, we have a, 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 an early calendar that was made by uh, Inuit hunter. Again, you can see the, uh, uh, the preoccupation that uh, Inuit have with the product of the, hit, of the, of the hunt. This is basically a tally of animals he's caught up to a certain date. The markings around the edge of the calendar are days of the week. Obviously, the crosses are Sundays. Uh, the ones that are sort of scored off are days that have already passed. But that, that gives you some idea of the introduction of uh, our time, the beginning of uh, Inuit accepting uh, industrial time, as it were.
For Inuit, the changing seasons determine not only their day-to-day -day activities, but also their diet, dwelling locations, and family groupings as they moved about their local area in response to the migrations of the animals on which they depended. The annual cycle was reckoned usually by 13 moon months, beginning with the first new moon coinciding with the sun's return. The designation of each moon was based on recurring events in the natural world, such as the birth of seals, pups, the nesting of birds, the thickening of caribou pelts, and the freezing of the sea ice. Significantly, moon months in the depth of winter marked, were marked by the appearance of certain stars. And in a moment, we'll look at uh, some of these particular months. Uh, you can see here the uh, the, 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 how the names of the moon months uh, pick up uh, things that are going on in the environment. Uh, we've, th there's, uh, th this one was important, caribou hair sheds. Uh, it, was a, it was a moon when, uh, when it was good to go caribou hunting to catch caribou for, for winter, winter clothing. The one down here, Tusaktut, meaning hearing, uh, perhaps its meaning isn't immediately uh, obvious, but this happened around about early November when the ice was thick enough to allow dog team travel and remote camps could then visit each other by dog team, uh, because in these days, of course, there were no communications like we have today. The moon of uh, Tauvigjuak, literally meaning great darkness, spanned the sunless period straddling the winter solstice. This was a period of relative inactivity, and resources at this time were often scarce. But to the extent permitted by available moonlight or twilight, uh, Inuit would still try to hunt on the sea ice, but it was often unproductive. Storytelling and indoor games help pass the time. String figures, or cat's cradles, as they're sometimes known, were especially popular and were played almost obsessively. I'll just mention that elders would tell me that uh, various camps had different uh, kinds of string figures and uh, they would, people would be sent on long journeys actually to get someone's new invention of a string figure. It was only during the sunless period that these games were permitted because it was widely believed that string figures would entangle the sun as soon as she appeared on the horizon. The appearance of two stars, which we call Altair and Tarazed, but which the Inuit call Agjuk, in the northeastern quadrant of the sky around mid-December, was taken as a sign of winter solstice as well as a promise of the sun's return. The next one is Sikhinarot. Uh, this literally means that the sun is possible. And obviously it was a month of the returning sun. And for Inuit, marked the beginning of a new year. Until the introduction of Christianity to the Iglulik area in the 1920s and 30s, the sun's annual return was an occasion for celebration of renewal, symbolized by the extinguishing and then relighting of the soapstone lamps with a new flame. This ceremony was also said to strengthen the land. The ceremony usually involved children extinguishing the lamps, uh, and I think the involvement of children themselves, a symbol of renewal, uh, was used particularly for that purpose. Uh, the, the lamps in, uh, among the igloos of, uh, of each community would be relit from a single flame, a new flame from tinder that was kept especially for that purpose. And you can imagine that uh, uh, temperatures, uh, let's say 40 Celsius below, or 30 as it could easily be then, uh, caused, uh, didn't really invite people to extinguish their only source of heat, uh, but the sun's return was uh, so significant to them 
that these uh, observances were, were made without any, any complaint. In recent years, uh, this celebration has been re-established and is now a major community event. Uh, the image on the screen shows the soapstone lamp used in the ceremony just after it has been relit. Note the parallel imagery between the lamp flame and the inset picture of the sun peaking just above the horizon. When the sun comes back, it's literally on the horizon for a few minutes before disappearing again. Traditionally, the return of the sun was an anxious time for Inuit. Due to the effects of atmospheric refraction, the sun often appeared reluctant to return, sometimes he hesitating and behaving erratically on the horizon. And I, on, the, uh, on a, a number of occasions in Iglulik, uh, when I've witnessed the return of the sun, the day you, you would, it would always be back earlier than the prescribed date uh, uh, astronomically because of this phenomena that we know as refraction. But you would see, uh, you would see just a tip off at some days and then remarkably the next day you wouldn't see it again. There would be a glow but no sun and then the next day it would be above. And this bouncing around the horizon was very typical of the sun's return and I think I think it, uh, it really led to Inuit uncertainty uh, about uh, the sun's actual return, uh, which was never taken for granted, and taboos at this time were carefully observed, one of which was to destroy the cords of the string figures. And as I've already mentioned, there was fear that these string figures, even symbolically, would prevent the sun from rising. With the sun now back on the horizon, string games were replaced by a game called Ayagak. And this is a cup and ball game where the player tried to impale a caribou vertebra, usually on a bone spike, and the action of tossing up the vertebra was said to encourage the sun to rise. In fact, uh, some songs that go with the game of Ayagak uh, include references to the sun rising higher and higher. The next month, and this is the last month uh, that involves the actual sun's return, was called Khangataksan, uh, and that uh, literally means that the sun is increasingly rising. It's Elevation was carefully observed, and, and I think this all goes back to the uncertainty that Inuit had about the sun really coming back. So in Iglulik, at least, uh, they would actually measure the sun and its return by, in successive days, seeing if the sun would first fit between the extended thumb, mid-thumb, and the, or, or harpoon thumb first, harpoon first, then the thumb of a mitt, and then finally with the mitt appearing to fit between the sun's lower limb and the horizon at noon. When it had reached this point, it was called uh, Pualotanikpok, and Pualotanikpok literally means mitted. The sun has been mitted. This stage was called Pualotanikpok, and occurred a few weeks be be before spring equinox. And it really marked the end of the winter's dark period. You know, it were now confident that the sun was back. Light levels were rising increasingly, and the seals and walls on which they depended were beginning to become more accessible. The worst of the winter was behind them, and although temperatures remained low, the warmer days of spring were in the offing. And around this time, which was a time of promise, they would note the two stars that they called Akutuyuk, but which are known to us as Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, appearing on the horizon, uh, fairly above the southern horizon, just after sunset when the sky was still bright to the west. And there's a song still well known in the Iglulik area which celebrates the sighting of the Akutuyuk stars. 
And in translation, the last verse goes, Akutuyuk appear, yonder the daylight, it is a joyous feeling that again in the broad daylight will I sleep. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Our first three speakers <clears throat> have taken us to different latitudes here in the Americas. <clears throat> now we are going to swing across the Atlantic Ocean to Africa. Dr. Babatunde Lawal is a professor of art history at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. <clears throat> he specializes in African and African diaspora art with a personal research focus on the ancient and contemporary arts of Nigeria, particularly the visual culture of the Yoruba and its influences in the Americas. His publications on Yoruba art examine its ontological, social, cultural, religious, and aesthetic implications, as well as the dynamics of change. Much of his data derives from formal and iconographic analyses, reinforced with field interviews and from the Odu Ifa, a collection of origin myths, astronomical speculations, philosophical commentaries, and remedies handed down from the past, and often referenced by Yoruba diviners to help clients in times of crisis. As we will learn, cultural astronomy looms large in Yoruba culture and art being used for a variety of purposes such as social control, measuring time, determining direction, coping with the vicissitudes of the existential process, and most importantly, reinforcing their belief in life after death. Dr. Lawal's presentation is titled, A Big Calabash with Two Halves, The Yoruba Vision of the Cosmos. Please welcome Baba Tunde Lawal. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Lawal, you oh, okay. have until about 25 after. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Smithsonian Institution for inviting me to participate in this uh, symposium. Well, uh, I'll go straight to the topic. As is well known, cultural astronomy is a co complex uh, subject. It is much more than an inquiry into the nature and significance of heavenly bodies. It also entails the use of celestial observations for measuring time, controlling human behavior, as well as for creating ritual and agricultural calendars, among others. In addition, cultural astronomy is dif in different parts of the world has given rise to a variety of cosmological speculations and belief systems, all aimed at giving life meaning and purpose. My presentation today examines this phenomenon among the Yoruba of West Africa and how they use it through the visual and performing arts to educate the public, measure time, determine direction, cope with the existential process, and above all, reinforce their quest for eternal life. Numbering more than 25 million people, the Yoruba are found in present-day republics of Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. Most of them live in southwestern Nigeria, divided into numerous kingdoms. Major towns are headed by monarchs, Oba, who claim descent from Odudua, a divine ancestor often identified as the first king of Ilefe. The ancient city, widely venerated as the cradle of Yoruba culture and where the world was created. Hence the popular saying, Ife o ye, Ibiojumo Timowa, Ife, the land of sunrise. By the beginning of uh, the second millennium of the, of the common era, Ilefe had become a major urban center with highly sophisticated religious, social, 
and political institutions. In fact, they are a monolith for measuring time. And we have Professor Willett of Cambridge. You know, it's a site of uh, intensive archaeological uh, work. The city is world famous for its uh, arts, whose style varies from the naturalistic to the highly stylized, all reflecting a period, in fact, the date between the 11th and the 17th centuries, all ref reflecting a period of advanced cultural and economic development. As in other parts of uh, Africa, the Yoruba have uh, astronomers and astrologers called uh, Ojogbon. These are philosophers, our, our star, you know, star readers, Adamushe, occultists. There are professional diviners revered as keepers of Yoruba divination narratives called Oduifa, comprising creation stories, details of time-honored rituals, quasi-historical accounts often cited to relate the past to the present in the attempt to predict or solve uh, problems. Scholars of Yoruba history, art, religion, and cultural astronomy are fortunate in that several volumes of Oduifa have been published for teaching and research uh, purposes. In fact, uh, even in the Americas here, there are institutions helping to advance the knowledge of IFA. In fact, in 2005, UNESCO recognized IFA divination practice among the Yoruba as a world uh, heritage. My interpre interpretation of Yoruba cosmology has benefited immensely, not only from Oduifa, but also from Yoruba oral traditions, as well as interviews with indigenous astrologers, and from my own research. It is worth mentioning that Yoruba oral traditions include special terms, an aphorism for theorizing and interpreting the visual and performing arts. A review of Yoruba cosmology reveals a strong belief in a supreme creator called Olodumare, the eternal one or the ultimate cause, the, generation, the generator of Ashe. Ashe is a vital force or power that enables the sun to shine, the moon and stars to glitter, the wind to blow, the rain to fall, and the river to flow. It gives form to the formless, motion to the motionless, and life to living things. It is present in all phenomena, both animate and inanimate. This power sustains the cosmos, which the Yoruba conceptualize as the big calabash with two halves, Igban Lameji, Sojuderaun, also called Igbaiwa, the calabash of existence. The top half signifies sky or heaven or room, the spirit world and the domain of Olodumare, also known as Alashe, the source of Ashe. The bottom half of the calabash represents the primeval waters out of which the physical world was later created. Unlike the creator deities in other African cultures, the Yoruba supreme creator does not act directly, but makes things happen through a host of spirits and nature forces called Orisha. Each Orisha personifies a natural or cultural phenomenon. Thus, Obatala exemplifies creativity, Ishwelegba communication, Arumila divination, knowledge, wisdom, Odudua, the divine king, and so on and so forth. In fact, technology is also personified, agriculture, 
All these elements are personified to facilitate some kind of communication between the human and the superhuman, and in the process, you know, enable the Yoruba to influence and manipulate uh, the forces of nature. As the story goes, in the beginning, only water existed below the sky, that is, in the bottom half of the calabash of existence. Olodumare later gave Odudua a sacred bird and a bag of sand with which to transform the primeval waters into habitable land. This is, the one on the right is a contemporary interpretation of this uh, creation myth. Odudua descended from the sky, poured the sand on the primeval waters, and released the bird to spread the sand, eventually creating land. The Yoruba term, Okun Daye, that is, the ocean turned into land, commemorates this event. In view of its uh, participation in creation, the bird motif features prominently in Yoruba rituals as a power symbol. And one can see the messengerial function of the bird here because it commutes between heaven and earth. It is seen as uh, a symbol of ritual agency. The chameleon is another important uh, creature in Yoruba cosmology. For it was the chameleon that Olodumare reportedly asked to go and ascertain if the newly created land was solid enough for human occupation. No wonder the chameleon signifies clairvoyance, caution, immunity, and a metaphysical capacity to survive against all odds, among others. Hence, its motif has a talismanic significance in Yoruba rituals and headdresses. After receiving reports that the newly created land below the sky was ready for occupation, the Supreme Being commissioned the creativity deity of Atala to mold the first human images from clay. The images were then infused with ashe, or a soul, or different souls, and subsequently placed inside the lower female half of the cosmic calabash symbolized in the womb, to be delivered by pregnant women. As a result, at times, when, some women, are anxious, when women are anxious to have children, they are advised to go and get dolls to implore Obatala to give them a child. In fact, uh, the creation of the body by Obatala is commemorated in the name Oshashono, the deity created a work of art. So there's an attempt here to trace the origin of artistic creativity among humans to the spiritual. As a result, the body is perceived by the Yoruba as a work of art that makes the soul manifest in the physical world, defining individual existence, Iwa. So one can see some kind of correlation between the body and a work of art. But to the Yoruba, it is much more than flesh, bones, and blood. It signifies the self in various uh, ways. As a result to the Yoruba, earthly life is an interface of spirit and matter, a kind of performance in time and space. During which, during which the body articulates in the individual existence in response to the rhythm generated by the soul. 
According to one divination text, Ifa Yorosu, on the origin of the universe, the Yoruba word for humanity, Enyo, is an abbreviation of that is the Homo sapiens. That is those specially commissioned by Olodumare to transform the primeval wilderness below the sky into an orderly estate. In other words, or in effect, the word in here not only identifies the human body as a divinely inspired intelligent form, it also implies that the capacity to create and appreciate art is an integral part of humanity, accounting for the aesthetic impulses in poetry, music, dress, pottery, sculptures, and other forms of material culture. Now, it is worth mentioning that some of the Orishas, including Obatala, the artist deity, allegedly assumed the same human body in order to accompany the first mortals to the earth. In fact, Ogun, the deity of uh, tools and weapons, is said to have led the way, that is the first mortals and other deities, using its machete to cut a path through the primordial jungle, laying the foundation for Yoruba culture and civilization. In fact, during festival for Ogun, you see priests using you know, the machete as though clearing path, creating civilization. So the popular name Ogunlano commemorates this event. In short, all the principal Yoruba Orisha allegedly contributed significantly to the transformation of the earth into the civilization it has, be it has become today. Besides, some Orisha allegedly became rulers of certain towns during their sojourn on earth, intermarrying with humans who now venerate them as divine ancestors. Other deities miraculously disappeared, leaving behind figurative uh, and non-figurative uh, symbols for communicating with them in the spirit world. This legend soon gave rise to a tendency among the Yoruba to identify culture heroes on the grounds that they are supernatural beings temporarily incarnated in human forms to facilitate direct interaction with mortals. So it is that some Yoruba deities are personified in art and altars. Others can be embodied through spirit uh, mediumship. Now, the popular Yoruba saying, Aye Lodja or Runile, the world is a market. Heaven is home, throws more light on the Yoruba concept of humanity. It connotes the, de the descent of an embodied soul from heaven to participate metaphorically in a business venture on earth which will end at death. However, to the Yoruba, death, iku, is not the end of life, but rather a kind of disembodiment of the soul and its return home to heaven where it may reincarnate as a newborn baby to start a new life on earth. For instance, uh, whenever children are born immediately after the death of uh, grandparents, they are named after those grand grandparents, being perceived as those grandparents reincarnated. For instance, my own name, Babatunde, means father returns, implying that my grandfather has reincarnated in me. If a woman, Yetunde, mother returns. On the other hand, the symbolic equation of the marketplace with the physical world derives in part 
from the deification or identification of the earth as a goddess who provides the bulk of the raw materials that sustains a culture's economy. While men are in charge, often in charge of production, especially of crops and livestock, women dominate retail business. As Margaret Drural points out, women control the central market and its administrative head holds a position in the king's council of chiefs. In effect, the marketplace metaphor in Yoruba culture identifies earthly existence as a complex web of social interactions and negotiations, a kind of business venture that requires an individual to develop special skills so as to make life profitable. The emphasis on the head, Ori, in Yoruba visual culture, deserves special attention here. It reflects a strong belief that the head is to the body what a king is to a kingdom and by extension, what the supreme being is to the cosmos, a source of power. Moreover, the head of an individual is thought to have uh, two aspects. The physical head, that is the visible one, which identifies the self, and the metaphysical head, the seat of the soul, that not only empowers existence, but also enables certain individuals, especially diviners, to de develop extraterrestrial perceptions reflected in cultural astronomy. No, needless to say, success in life also depends on how well one is able to make good use of one's head. No wonder in the past, sorry, Adults uh, Yoruba were expected to dedicate an altar to their inner head, which because uh, this inner head localizes the ashe, connecting the individual to the, to the supreme uh, God. Note the recurrence of the cone motif in Yoruba visual culture. because it denotes the apical position of the head on the human body and in the cosmos. To the Yoruba, the top of the cone in, you know, connotes the cutting edge that the head provides in solving problems or, negotiation, or neg negotiating the vicissitudes of life. In fact, the Yoruba adage says, Ori lejafin labu, it is with the head that the fish cuts through the deep. It is with the head that the bird you know, moves through the sky. May my head continue to guide me. Of course, the head is the seat of the brain, which enables humanity to observe and study the sky and use the knowledge for various purposes. In fact, uh, the gurus at NASA have uh, special heads that enable them to develop uh, all kinds of gadgets. And uh, so, so note the importance of the head. Now, most, while most uh, divine, divination verses are silent on how the sun or and the moon came into being. Nonetheless, they identify sun and the moon as children of the great mother called Yemaja. The sun is regarded as male and moon female, the latter being associated with the menstrual cycle in Koshu. Hence, during the waxing phase 
of the moon, maidens and newly married women pray to the moon to bless them with children. Moreover, certain rituals called ajidewe, that is wake up and feel younger, are performed during the waxing phase of the moon to promote longevity and prosperity. Hence the popular saying, lotun lotun la boshu, as fresh as the new moon. So these rituals associated with the moon easily explain the frequency of the crescent motif in Yoruba art, as one can see here. The stars are perceived as children of the sun and moon. There are stories of frequent conflict in the past between both resulting in solar and lunar eclipses. As cultural geographer Afalabi Ojo explains, in order to reduce such conflicts between the sun and the moon to the barest minimum, Olodumare separated them, allocating to the sun the day and to the moon the night. Each has since been supreme in its own territory or and period. As the sky belonged to the moon during the night, the sun stole back in a flash from the west to east at midnight in order to get ready the following day. The moon, in a similar manner, assumed its position in the sky at midday when the sun was too much engaged to have time to interfere. The seasonal irregularities in the sun's nightly return flight resulted in clashes with the moon, eclipse of the moon, and so on and so forth. So these solar and lunar movements are associated with the cardinal points, the east implying sunrise, the noon north, you know, the north, you know, midday, and so on and so forth. And then the south, we have west, sunset, and then the south, associated with the night, the transition, you know, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the cardinal directions are associated with major deities. As a result, you know, time can be calculated on the basis of the appearance of the sun and the moon. In fact, uh, in many parts of Ife, there are monoliths you know, dating back to the 11th century allegedly used to determine you know, the directions of the sun as well as shadows. In fact, a German uh, explorer visiting Ife around 1910 was told how the shadows were interpreted along with the cries of certain birds to the time, determine time. The diurnal movements of sun and moon also determined the four days of the Yoruba week in the past. And then these days are associated with uh, various uh, deities or uh, Orisha and so on and so forth. Admit admittedly, Yoruba oral tradition are vague on the topography of the top half of the Calabash, or no, yet there is a strong belief that it has many layers, about seven, and that the supreme being occupies the topmost one. In the lower half dwell the deities of, that is heaven, the celestial beings, souls of deceased ancestors, while the bottom half represents the domain of the earth goddess. 
In fact, the middle portion, portion here is called the Leaye, the world of the living. So the Yoruba landscape is divided into three parts. You have uh, residential areas called Ilu, that is the cultivated land. Then you have adjacent farms, Oko, part of the ordered uh, sphere. And then you, we have uh, the wilderness, a kind of terra incognita, occupied by all kinds of uh, spirits. The existence of lagoons and lakes here and there on the surface of the earth has given rise to a popular belief that the landscape floats on a body of water, accessible through wells and other holes. In fact, the Yoruba speculate that there is a big river underground that souls of the dead must cross on their way to heaven. As a result, whenever somebody dies, that person is said to have crossed the river. The rainbow deity, the celestial snake, is said to connect the earthly river to the sky, helping to recycle water that falls as rain from the sky. And it is this water that helps to sustain the physical world as a commercial center. In fact, one can see here emphasis on the rainbow. The rainbow is associated with prosperity because of that and so on. Now, there is a problem here because uh, in Yoruba cosmology, there is a belief that uh, the world is uh, a complex of opposing forces. In fact, uh, the first and second speakers mentioned opposing forces in the universe. In fact, the Yoruba perception of the eclipse as a conflict between the sun and sky is part of this widespread belief. So what we see here, there's a belief, kind of oppositional complementarity of sun, sun and moon, day and night, hot and cold, wet and dry, visible and invisible, all complementing one another. Hence, there's this popular saying, tibi tire la dale aye, that is, the world is sustained by good and evil. And inu kokodudu, like of it is out of a black pot that the white porridge comes out. In other words, you use a black pot to, pr to cook and make white porridge. The implication here, apart from signifying that good things can come out of a bad event and vice versa, it also relates night to daylight because daylight comes out of the night. No wonder Yoruba cosmology has forces associated with those of the right and those of the left. Those of the left are associated with evil and those of the right with good and so on and so forth. So there are all kinds of implications for this. As a result of that, there's a belief that there are certain deities created by Olodumare to reconcile these forces that are in perpetual opposition to one another, part of a dualism. And one of the deities associated with this balancing act is Eshu, Elegba, the divine messenger, who is associated with the crossroads. And then we have uh, Ifa, associated with divination to help uh, humans to, to find problems, uh, to find solutions to problems. So Eshu is frequently represented as double-faced, emphasizing its ability to negotiate with the forces of good and those of evil. It's also associated with the crossroad because it links the north to the south, east and west. 
And one can see this uh, metaphor in some of its symbols you know, with three or four figures. The other deity is Ifa, the deity of wisdom. In fact, uh, Ifa sort of uh, signifies the intelligence of the supreme being. And then note you know, four figures here alluding to the cardinal points in addition to Eshu. So the interaction of Ifa and Eshu, especially during the divination process, has allowed humans to find problems, to find solutions to all kinds of problems. And we see here those individuals who specialize in the knowledge of the cosmos using divination tray to help find uh, these solutions. So the divination tray comes in various sizes. The round or circular ones evoke uh, the calabash, the cosmic calabash. The semicircular divination trays may either signify the upper half or the lower half, and then we have a rectangular or square calabash you know, representing the four corners of the world. In this 18th century divination board, we see a combination of the circular and the rectangular to emphasize the interconnectedness of heaven and earth. So this is the diviner trying to communicate with uh, the other worldly. And then note the faces alluding to the cardinal points. In fact, the center of the divination board connects heaven and earth. In fact, in some more recent uh, interpretation of the divination board, you can see the star in the center, so that the center mirrors the world above. And the face is, say, is said to represent that of the divine messenger, who communicates messages you know, from heaven to earth and vice versa. So this is uh, a priest or a divination priest. Again, note the recurrence of the bird motif on that. Another important deity in Yoruba cosmology is Shango, associated with the thunderstorm and social justice. And note the double axe aspect of Shango, representing the interaction of male and female in the cosmos, because uh, life sort of uh, depends on this uh, interface. And Shango is also associated with the positive and negative. Through rainfall, agriculture is possible, but the same rainfall is attended by lightning that can lead to the destruction of life and property. In fact, uh, one can see the allusion to fire from the sky descending into the earth, the body of Mother Earth, uh, the earth goddess. And then during the thunderstorm, certain lamps may be lit in an attempt to control you know, the movement of Shango across the sky. Because when there is lightning, Shango is said to be riding fire like a horse. So there's an attempt to control. This control also entails the use of the human body to manifest the power and presence of Shango. Note how even male priests braid their hair. And uh, the implication here is that uh, you are trying to femaleize the, female, you know, the male body to make it as powerful spiritually as that of women, because women use their body to mediate souls of babies from heaven to earth. And uh, the power with which they are, able, they are able to procreate is different from muscular power. So that we begin to see how men try to acquire certain aspects of female power in an attempt to mediate, use their body to mediate this powerful deity without uh, sustaining serious injury. 
Note the color of Shango, red, associated with fire. Fire can be negative when it burns the body or burns uh, the environment, but can be positive when it is used for cooking. Fire, you know, red is also associated with the blood, you know, with, uh, with blood, which invigorates uh, the body. In fact, Chongo can manifest in the body of a priest. And note the use of blue associated with uh, water, red, fire, white, spirituality. And one can see here, uh, the Agbeno is a male priest with braided hair to signify the descent of fire from the sky to be absorbed by Mother Earth. And then the movement of, of the flame is associated with Oya, the tornado goddess who collaborates with Shango during a thunderstorm. In fact, the Yoruba believe that without Oya, the female partner of Shango, Shango is powerless. So we begin to see this emphasis on the complementarity of the male and the female. Note the fan motif here. Because Oya has a major influence on Shango, she's able to either use the fan to cool Shango's temper, or at the same time use that fan to infuriate Shango. So one can see this elephant and this emphasis on duality, you know, dualism in Shango art. So one can see the correspondence between the thunderbolt born by the priest with the fire. This is fire, this is fire. The container here is also trying to contain Shango's uh, power. And then one can see the duality here. Shango is also believed to have the power to punish offenders and then reward uh, those who are righteous. And finally, we look at Earth Goddess, who controls the market. The, there, is a mem there is a society called the Boni. Individuals, you know, men and women, who have attained uh, distinguished positions in their professions, they become members of this society. They call themselves Omoya, children of the same mother. Even though the earth is perceived as female, most of the altars have male and female figures, implying that uh, she has, the earth has uh, elements of maleness and femaleness, metaphysically, not in the way we identify gender in the physical world. The male and female aspect also signify the ability of the mother to reward because the female body is soft, associated with motherhood, and then the male punishment, hardness. So in Yoruba culture, female gentility, man forceful. So we see these two elements you know, combined, and then you can see some, ima you know, some images of the mother earth with two faces, one male punish the other female. And then this is the symbol of members called a dog bony. In Oboni formula, one plus one may equal three. Because a male and a female is conjoined by the presence of Mother Earth, the invisible witness to human dealings. So we can see these elements. And then this is a female figure with a male heart, emphasizing that Mother Earth is able to have the power to punish and then to reward at the same time. Finally, we see an Egungu mask used to embody the soul of ancestors returning to the society, emphasizing the belief that the body is a mask. And at death, the soul leaves the mask. A human mask can be created as a substitute, as a surrogate for the body. And that is why during annual festivals, masks are used to incarnate the souls of returning ancestors. Note the emphasis on the face. Naturalism in Yoruba art 
signifies the body physical in flesh. Whereas stylization, the metaphysical body, emphasizing the dislocation of the soul from the body. So the Egungo attempts to provide a new body and then note the stylized uh, face, emphasizing the essence of humanity rather than the specificity of a particular individual. So one can see an attempt to use a kind of call and response to ignite uh, you know, the mask. In fact, igniting in Yoruba culture means do when you dance, you are burning. There's a synergy in the body. And that is what we have here. So that during the performance of uh, the Gungu, the colors evoke the rainbow that recycles elements in the universe. And one sees uh, this attempt to make the spirit manifest. So that to the Yoruba, death is not a finality. It's only a separation of the soul from the body. So it is a victory of the human spirit over death. In fact, the Yoruba word, Ojutiku, shame and death, celebrates this belief that life is eternal. The body, the material body, is temporal. In fact, that tradition also survives in the U.S. In many parts, in fact, recently, the tradition has been revived in many parts. So remember, memorialize important people and in fact, you can see here a Google for Duke Ellington. So we see in art an attempt to read the, uh, the celestial phenomena and then use the knowledge to reinforce life and uh, sort of nurse the belief in a kind of life after, life uh, after death. Thank you very much. Wonderful, oh, fantastic. Thank you. thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> wow, we've sort of been all over the planet now and in up and down. What I'd like to do now in our remaining time, oh yes, we don't have any. But yes, we're going to go for a little while longer <clears throat> and have some questions and answers. So I'm going to ask our speakers to come up onto the stage and we're going to pull some chairs out here. Uh, I apologize that Dr. Erton had another appointment that he had to go to, so he will not be joining us for this. And I want to remind you that if you want to ask a question, please use the microphone in the center of the room so that the uh, people out there in computer land and our webcasting audience can hear your question. Otherwise, it will be totally lost. <coughs> Okay, thank you. Would someone like to start with a question? I know you guys are dying to ask some stuff. Please go up to the microphone. Yes, that one right there. Oh, hi, Stephen. Um, thank you all for a really exciting afternoon. It was uh, just wonderful to flip around between this place and the other place and all over the world. I really appreciate all the speakers. Um, I'm an archaeologist. I work in the Arctic, um, and I wanted to touch on another aspect of astronomy, which is meteorites. I know Mr. Price mentioned it briefly. Um, and in, in the Arctic, there was a famous meteorite fall, uh, which was iron rich, and so um, people traveled to get this meteorite um, to make tools out of it. But I'm wondering if, if any of the speakers had any other um, insights into um, th th those less um, 
permanent aspects of astronomy, but meteorites and comets, if, uh, if, if there was uh, native knowledge or, or observations or thoughts about uh, meteorites and comets. In 20 years of uh, interviewing Iglulic elders, uh, I can honestly say that there was no mention of comets, uh, very little mention of the planets, and I, and I think there's a reason for that. When the sky is unavailable for three or four months of the year because of the midnight sun or extended twilight, it's very difficult to observe, uh, observe uh, other features of the sky, like planets or, or, or comets. I'll just, uh, I'll just mention that the, the planet Venus, uh, the, as far as I could see, that was recognized and it was called the, the great star, Urluriak uh, Joak. And we only had one interview in which, uh, as the planets, as their name implies, are, are wanderers. They're never, they're never uh, you, you can't really predict their, uh, through, uh, let's say, basic observation, you can't really predict their, their position in the sky. And I can remember one elder was extremely alarmed around Christmas time one year when Venus didn't uh, uh, appear in the sky, and she felt that uh, uh, perhaps uh, this had huge significance because she always associated Venus with the Christmas period. <coughs> Uh, obviously, this was after the introduction of Christianity, and the absence of Venus from the sky at a time she usually saw it uh, bothered her. With respect uh, to uh, to meteorites, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, they, they they knew about uh, they, they were called ingertok, uh, meaning they were really fiery. Uh, and they distinguished them from shooting stars, which uh, to be polite about it were called the, when they, they saw shooting stars, they said it was the stars defecating. Uh, but but uh, the m meteorites, uh, and I think uh, you were referring particularly to the, to the ones in Greenland, uh, that there was a long uh, history of these that uh, I won't go into now, but from the Iglulic uh, uh, point of view, meteorites were, were recognized, but uh, uh, very little stories uh, connected with them. Thank you. Okay, the Yoruba regard the stars as Irawo. Now, meteorites and uh, shooting stars are also called Irao. Yet, when you have a shooting star across the sky, some suspect that a great tree has fallen, an important person must have died. And if you check very well all over the Yoruba country, maybe an important person has died. One aspect. Then Venus is identified as Aguala, very close to the sun. And then Sirius is called Orisha Oko because of its use by fishermen at night for direction. Otherwise, all the other stars are just regarded as children of the moon as a result of some kind of um, marriage in the Ojibwe tradition, the, the words that I've come across uh, for a, a, a shooting star is basically chingwen. And for meteorites, uh, are, are like uh, meteorite showers, um, the Ojibwe uh, came up with a, or had a word called rain stars. Give me one anungguk. So, and, and that, that's about all I know at this point. I'm, I'm still researching and asking questions about those names, but those are the two that I've come up with thus far. Other questions? I'm just wondering, because this is an astronomy, um, uh, symposium. I'm curious about whether you 
have um, thoughts, theories, or actual facts um, about the upcoming December 21st, 2012 um, astronomical lineup or whatever that is supposed to be occurring that day. <laughs> My other question is very mundane, is it that the city in South Carolina, what is the, uh, the, that place in South Carolina, what is the large city near it? That is Sheldon, okay. Sheldon in South Carolina. In fact, uh, between July and August, a lot of uh, African Americans, Hispanic Americans who trace uh, ancestry to the Yoruba, congregate in Sheldon to celebrate the Yoruba heritage. In fact, there is a Yoruba village there where our ancestors are remembered, there are masks, and the tradition is spreading to other parts of the Americas. And not only that, if you go to Brazil, in fact, time limitation did not allow me to show Masking in Brazil, Shango LM monuments in Brazil, in the Caribbean, in Cuba, everywhere. So, of course, people say the world is becoming a village. Now, during the celebrations, even Anglo Americans participate because of the Yoruba cosmology, which says the world started at Ife and that both black and white left Ife. In fact, in the past, whenever white people visited Ife, they were greeted, welcome home. And that was what they did to the first enslavers. Only to be <laughs> enslaved later. Even the colonial masters were regarded as spirit beings. In fact, Obatala is said to have created people in many colors, of many shapes. And that if we, we, are, we, are, we were all to look alike, either all beautiful or ugly, this world would be monotonous. And that is why it is necessary to have this variety of colors in humanity. Humanity is one. The material aspect of the body may differ in the interest of variety. Any of you guys want to take a shot at the other question? No, I don't. No, it was a short. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I don't. I don't particularly know anything about that tradition. I, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Go to the microphone, please. Yes, I think the the closest uh, representative has already left. I think she's referring to the end of the Mayan long count on the twelfth. That's a guess. I was well, wondering if that's what you were talking about. Yeah, um, well, uh, that gentleman had a question, though, before my question, if you wanted to come up. Oh. You're already um, there. So walking from the north to the south, uh, the transition of Orion in the far north means you get to sleep in daylight. The transition of Orion in Minnesota means spring roughly coming. I, I wasn't quite sure. I didn't know if you gentle people had the opportunity to track what certain transitions of constellations means as you move further south. I noted that the first speaker thought that the Pleiades were kind of the big thing, the big marker for seasons and so forth, but I would be personally curious to hear what is thought uh, among the Puebloan peoples or among the Apache who are kind of in between whether particular constellations mean a ri particular constellations rising and falling mean a particular thing, planting time, harvest time, that sort of thing. If Dr. Erton were here, <clears throat> I think what he would say, because <clears throat> I read his book, <clears throat> is that our cultural, our understanding of the stars is always culturally based and that cultural base 
he argues, almost always comes down to food. You know, so we're using this to help us understand whether it's agricultural cycles, whether it's hunting cycles, or whatever. But he also makes the point, and this was sort of the question I had down here, is that the sky, to some extent we can talk about the night sky as being kind of a cultural Rorschach, in which we see what we already understand. I mean, it helps us understand some things, but then there's also what we project onto it. I had an experience the other night, I can see a little bit of the northern sky from my apartment in Baltimore, and I can see the Big Dipper going around the North Star, and I can't see a whole lot else, and there's all this urban light that stops me from seeing a whole lot of stars, but I had particularly clear, and I was like, oh wow, I can see those, and I can see those. Gosh, I wonder what they are. I wish I knew my constellations, blah, 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 blah. And then having read Gary Ertin's book, I said, I can just make up my own. <laughs> That's the big triangle. That's the big W over there. You know, it's why do I need somebody else's map? If I just look at the sky, I can make sense of it myself. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think that we will find, and it's an interesting question. I don't know if anyone has done that kind of comparative cultural astronomy, but that we would find that these things mean different things in different places, and it depends on their mode of production and all these other kinds of things. Pleiades is very important in a lot of cultures, which I find very interesting. Hawaiian culture, very important. Gentlemen? I've come across um, a story where the Hopi uh, Pueblos uh, look at Pleiades as a time to plant and a time to harvest, and they just happen to be at that particular latitude where you know their growing seasons correlate. Uh, but with the Pleiades, for us, being farther north, you know, that, that would not correlate. Well, for one thing, we're not agricultural traditionally. But um, the Pleiades had, for us, a, a cosmological, and, and I didn't include that in my presentation. The Pleiades was a cosmological um, constellation called Bagunegizhik, which means the hole in the sky. And right about the time of the winter solstice, uh, the, the Bagunegizhik is almost overhead. And that is kind of a, a of an alignment of the four worlds of, of the Ojibwe, um, the four levels of the universe. So there, that's how come that the cedar tree is sacred to us because it is like a cosmological axis that aligns the world uh, with the Bhagavad with the hole in the sky. So that's why we use cedar in, in our ceremonies. But it gets really complex when they start telling that story, and I didn't feel totally confident in bringing that story here until I have learned more about uh, those teachings. Another little thing about the Pleiades in, again, in South America, there was a very interesting scientific study done where some scientist guy or whatever was out there and was told by the villagers that every year the certain group of elders goes to the certain mountaintop before dawn and watches for the rise of the Pleiades. And depending on what they see, that determines what the year is going to be like and when they should plant. And so this was just written down as one of these kind of cultural knowledge things, blah, 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 blah. And then the scientist guy said, all right, let me check this out. So he went and checked it out. And it had to do with uh, the density of the atmosphere and how that made the Pleiades appear which is in a sort of kind of farmer's almanac way, told them, okay, it's going to be a wet year or a dry year. And that then determined, and he was able to document this and prove it scientifically, that they actually had science going on here. It wasn't just some kind of, I dare say the word, superstition. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that what we see in a lot of what we've talked about here is that there is deep cultural knowledge <clears throat> in all of these things that combines science uh, cultural understanding, psychology, a whole range of the human experience. Now, among the, the Yoruba, some astrologers, instead of looking at the sky, get a bowl of water to reflect the heavens. And it is from this bowl that the stars of certain individuals can be identified. So that if somebody is rich and famous, they say, Rawamintan, my star is shining. And then individuals will align, will be identifying a particular star with 
their own destiny. And when kings die, there are beliefs that certain stars will disappear from or recede back into space until a new king is installed. Of course, the body is a mask for mediating souls through reincarnation, through rites of passage. So stars are significant, but they are still children up there, subject to other forces. They are all Ashe. Ashe is a power, it's a force in the universe, all emanating from a source. Uh, I'll just, uh, <clears throat> I, I th I, and this is going back a bit to the question, I think uh, uh, this point has been made before, but I think it's important to, to know and repeat that uh, the, uh, the constellations as we know them are not uh, always what other people see. So when it comes to Orion, Orion don't see, uh, excuse me, Ian, uh, Inuit don't see Orion in the, same, in the same sense that we do. It's broken up. Uh, uh, the, the three main stars in Orion, the, the ones that I explained, the runners, they're just separated out of that to be a constellation that's actually linked with the Hyades and also uh, with the, uh, the major star Aldebaran. Uh, similarly, the other two stars that we're familiar with in Orion, that's Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, uh, they're ones uh, that are completely different uh, constellation or asterism, as you might call it, within Inuit culture. And uh, these are called Akutuyuk because of their separation. They mean two, two, two stars apart. Uh, and I'll just make a very quick point about uh, the, the gathering of uh, astronomical information these days from uh, lesser known peoples. And this, this is the huge amount of uh, acculturation that native astronomies are undergoing. Uh, I did some interviews in communities in northern Quebec uh, uh, near the Labrador coast. And I heard to my astonishment that they referred to the Big Dipper as Kadluti. And I said, I always thought it was Tuktogjuit, uh, meaning the caribou. And this uh, middle-aged uh, uh, lady said, no, it's, uh, it's Kadluti. And I said, well, when you translate that, it means dipper. So I said, where did you first learn that it was called Kadluti? And she said, uh, an Anglican minister, when I was very young, came into our house uh, in, a, in a dark night and said, uh, it, it was beautiful, clear tonight, and I looked up to the sky and I could see Kadluti. And uh, that's how she learned it. So through the back door, all our uh, acculturations creep in and begin to uh, really infect and affect uh, native cultural astronomies. Thanks. I'm afraid I have been given the time up signal, but uh, so I'm going to end the formal discussion and hope that those of you who have further questions will stick around and discuss with us. And I apologize for I've that. <clears throat> Thank you to all of our speakers and to the National Museum of African Art for the, initiating the uh, African Art Stellar Cosmos project. I would just like to say in closing, you know, one of the things that we've seen here is that, you know, we take the sky as a constant, and geologically speaking over time it's not really, but for our purposes it pretty much is, except that it differs what you see from one latitude to the next. And we've heard some stories here where stars are in fact ancestors, or when you die you become a star, and I would just like to suggest that stars and the stories, the associated artifacts in the landscape, uh, that have been described by some of our speakers here actually are a means by which our ancestors communicate with the people of today, conveying knowledge and ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.